Hello, everybody. Um, again, I'm sorry I can't be here today. Um, kind of unexpected last minute. So um, today um, we're going to do things a little bit differently since I can't uh, be in class to kind of go through some of the wrap up lecture uh, components of uh, some of the vocabulary, things you need to know. Um, next best thing is to make a video and have you guys listen to it and kind of go through it that way. So today's main topic is going to be talking about um, the different agreements between states and how they interact with each other um, and how they get along. So let me see here, I'm trying to start this process tools, add-ons. There we go, present. All right, there we go. All right, so one of the main reasons why uh, the Constitution was written was because states Oh, it's a bit easier to do it this way. One of the main reasons why the Constitution was written was because states were rivals and jealous of each other. Remember back from the articles, the articles, uh, first government, and how states kind of saw themselves as like their own, um, basically their own countries. They had their own money. Uh, they had their own militias. Um, most citizens felt more loyal to their state than to their country, which was obviously a major uh, problem uh, during that era. So the Constitution is ultimately supposed to reduce that tension, reduce the um, disagreements, which is why um, you have powers that are given to the federal government, powers that are given to the states, powers that are shared, uh, and you have processes that are mixed in that allows basically the federal government in some cases to be referees over state, uh, state squabble, state arguments, um, which is ultimately supposed to help uh, in that process. Uh, this slide you don't need to write down. Um, if you already did, sorry. All right. So one of the one of the first uh, important things you're gonna need to know uh, in terms of interstate relations, um, number one is interstate compacts. Um, as you can see uh, by the slide, it's an agreement among states to work together and share resources. That shared resource could could be money, um, it could be workers, it could be natural resources. Um, so states that make agreement amongst themselves to share different resources that, that, that they have at their disposal. So we're gonna some examples that I have down there for you, uh, just kind of showcase. Uh, in New York and New Jersey, um, they manage the same harbor uh, that is in between um, both uh, states. So they both take care of it. Um, they both built um, a, the, the bridge that links the two areas together as well. Um, so they share that. Um, you have states share law enforcement data uh, obviously, with 2019, you have internet, you have different resources that you can easily share files um, on criminal data um, amongst the states. So a lot of them, uh, actually, they are, there is an agreement where all 50 states do uh, share um, common criminal data. Uh, the third thing, thir the third example, the third of many, um, is that the Great Lakes uh, states have an agreement to help protect wildlife. Uh, the Lake Erie, the Great Lakes um are one of our greatest resources uh so the states uh like ohio and indiana um illinois wisconsin the the state up north um pennsylvania new york we all have agreements to make sure that we're putting and we're allocating money to protect one of ultimately our, our greatest uh fresh water source um so that's an example there on how states cooperate and work together um by making compacts uh, the second example that I have down here is a full full faith and credit clause. Um, basically, what this is, um, states have to recognize court judgments and official documents of another state. So, for instance, you get married in Ohio, you move to California, you move to Montana. Uh, the, the state that you move to has to recognize um, official documents um, from another state, uh, like marriage licenses, um, birth certificates, uh, things of that nature. Um, so kind of self-explanatory, kind of makes things easy. Um, you know, if you get a new job somewhere, uh, it just makes things a lot less of a hassle. Uh, those things are officials that can translate from one area to the next. And again, that is an article four, section one, um, of the constitution that does provide that right, um, to that. All right. Um, there are a couple exceptions to that though. Um, and one of the things in terms of divorces where it's kind of a, um, it's kind of a, a gray area, uh, for this, uh, divorces. So one, 
the exception would be your residency. Uh, there was something called um, called um, a cookie divorce, uh, where ultimately it's turned into a court case called Williams versus North Carolina, where last name Williams, this couple um, went to Las Vegas. Um, they lived there for six weeks. Um, went through the di- went through the courts there and got divorced. Um, so they can so one of the man so the man can get remarried. Um, and then they moved back to North Carolina. Well, the state of North Carolina didn't recognize the divorce because they didn't establish um, the residency requirement that was needed um, in order to do that. They felt like they went to Las Vegas just to go to divorce and they moved back, um, went to Supreme Court. Supreme Court ruled in favor of North Carolina that the divorce was not settled. He was still married. They didn't do a good enough job of establishing residency, moving somewhere for six weeks, moving back, kind of puts up some red flags there. Um, so that will be something that you will need to know, uh, for the test, uh, on Thursday, it won't be an extensive part of it, but it will be mentioned. So just know Williams versus North Carolina and what, a, and what a quickie divorce is kind of is what it sounds like. Uh, other exceptions will be, uh, civil trials and not criminals, not, not criminal trials. So civil trials, um, do have to uphold, um, you know, the state, um, laws criminal does not. Uh, so that's where the, the, there were, that's where there is a little exception there. Um, extradition. Um, for those that have seen Narcos on Netflix, this is a prime example of of what our, uh, of what extradition is. Pablo Escobar, arguably one of the biggest drug kingpins um, that the world has seen uh, back in the seventies and eighties. Um, he sent in cocaine and a bunch of drugs uh, from South America uh, all the way up in North America. Um, and he was extradited, uh, back to the United States to hold, um, uh, to be punished, uh, for his role in that, uh, for funneling in and having a system set up, funneling in a lot of drugs into our country. Uh, but extradition is the legal process by which a fugitive from one state can be returned, um, to that state. Basically all it is, is to prevent somebody from escaping. Uh, James Earl Ray, um, for instance, um, he um, he murdered um, MLK in the 1960s. Um, he fled, um, went to, uh, I believe he was captured in Great Britain. He was extradited back um, to um, whole court for his crimes. Um, so that's, another, that's, you know, that's another example of what extradition is. Um, threat somebody from escaping, has somebody received justice. Um, you see cases of this all the time where somebody has a murder in one state, flees to another state, and they're actually headed back um, to that state to hold um, punishment for their crimes. All right, last but not least, uh, this last major thing that you're going to be uh, required to know is the Privileges and the Immunities Clause. Um, this protects citizens uh, that move in between states. Um, so, for instance, you move from Ohio to Illinois, whatever the case might be, um, it protects um, it protects you as a citizen. So, for instance, the Constitution draws that you cannot draw unreasonable distinctions uh, with your own residents and those that live in another state. Uh, you must recognize, states must re- must recognize the right to travel in between states. Uh, again, with nowadays with business, um, vacationing, whatever the case might be, um, it's much more commonplace now to be able to um, to leave your state than what it was 200 years ago. But ultimately, they must recognize the right to travel. Uh, now, unreasonable distinctions, obviously, what does that mean? Um, so over the years, this has been interpreted by the Supreme Court uh, for a variety of cases. Example would be um, require employers to hire in-state residents. Um, so that's something that you cannot do. Um, so for instance, if you apply for a job in Chicago, they can't have a policy on the books that um, requires employers to hire people that are in state. Um, some states have done this in the past to try and lower their unemployment rates uh, in their states. Um, but again, you cannot draw that distinction between a person that lives in one place to a person that lives in another, whether it's in state or out of state, it makes no difference. Um, however, the one exception would be for college. Um, they can require non residents to pay higher licenses. Uh, than residents or tuitions. Um, 
so for instance, if you go to college in Illinois, you're going to pay a higher tuition. Now, why, why is that um, allowed? Well, it's because many universities are funded through taxpayer dollars. And if you, for instance, like Ohio State, we live in Ohio, we pay taxes. It's a state university. Um, if you if somebody from California wanted to go to Ohio State University, their parents obviously don't pay that tax to help fund um, that that college. So that's where, therefore, you pay a higher rate compared to others. All right. So anyway, um, that is it for today as far as the lecture. Uh, make sure that make sure that, that you guys have these notes. Um, I will check these tomorrow. Um, you will be doing a little Quizlet. Uh, here a little bit, which will ultimately be your study guide. Uh, they'll, they'll, it, it'll be due on Thursday, uh, just, just before your test, and tomorrow we will review. All right, thank you. So long.